So um, this is about uh, the how to access the suffix array if you just have the R index via a kind of mystical data structure called the phi inverse forest, which is not that nice forest shown in this picture. And um, this, this talk is also pre-recorded, so uh, it's, it's now a little bit shorter than what I did on YouTube, so you can enjoy all explanations there. Let's try and work together with Christina Hermann and Massimiano from, from University of Florida. Uh, yeah, and I'm uh, in Tokyo, you can see the background here uh, from uh, Tokyo Medical and Dental University. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so the goal is that we want to find a way how to get the suffix array if, if so random access on the suffix array if we have just the R index. And why is it important? Because the R index is a um, refined FM index in that, in that it takes less space than the FM index on repetitive text. But because of that, it, it has few samples and that makes accessing random access on the suffix array more difficult. Next, please. So for instance, if we take three sequences and we want to index them, what we usually do is that we concatenate them with a dollar sign and append a sharp. So the input text becomes this T and, okay, next slide, please. Okay, um, then what you get is if you want to compute the FM index that you usually compute all rotations of input text. So you get this huge rotation matrix. So bear with me for a few slides, this huge example with this tiny letter. So people in the back, please come forward. Uh, yeah, so what uh, the FM index does is that it takes the last column of this rotation matrix, which is also called the Boris Weaver transform or shortly BWT and builds a wavelet tree on it such that it can for free count the number of pattern occurrences. So you don't need any special other data structures for that. But if you think about how to locate, so you want to know where these pattern occurrences start in the text, then you need the suffix array. And with that, so if M index samples these suffix array uh, positions by, by text position. So uh, next slide, please. And if you think about, oh, yeah, that's right. Uh, the R index, what R index does is that it just takes for the RAM boundaries, the su uh, suffix array samples. So here highlighted in blue are the starting positions and in orange, the end position of each suffix area run, like um, this this red T run, single character T run, you have on the on the bottom something orange, on the top something in blue, and if it's blue with an orange border, that means it's just a single character run, so it's both the start and the end of the run. Okay, next please. So. If you just have this information about um, these, uh, the suffix around these run boundaries, how can you get access? And for that, there is this already famous toehold lemma, which states that if you just look at two consecutive suffix array positions, like here highlighted 9 and 17 on the right hand side, you can see that they have both the same BWT value. Then if you, for this blue value is a 9 in this example, you go one text position before, which is eight. And you take the next consecutive position in the BWT or in the suffix array. Then the differences of the above two values, eight, uh, nine and 17 and below eight and 16, which is both eight, so there is the same. And this is not by coincidence, it's just by the two old lemma. Uh, next slide, please. So you can, uh, think about that and iterate that process. Like here, we have seen that both TTs are the same. The next slide. Then you can get go down and see that. Next slide. 
uh, that there is also an AA. Next slide. <laughs> a couple of slides now. Um, the next, so the, then you can see here it stays the same difference. So it's still so 7 and 15. So and you can continue because it's a C and a C. Next slide. And here it's 9 and uh, 6 and 14, which is still 8. Next slide. And again here, and next slide. Sorry about that. And but, but here you can see that on the right hand side for 4 and 12, you have a T and the A, so they differ. The BWD differs, but at that point, the, the difference not. But if you look downwards in the next, uh, the previous value of 4, 3, and uh, the succeeding uh, suffix array value 20, they have not any more this difference of 8. So it works as long as you hit this this backward search kind of movement. Uh, it works as long as you don't hit the, the run boundary. So that you're at the end of a run, and then um, you, you break it by, by having a different character. Good. And next slide, please. So. What the RNX just stores are these samples at the run boundaries, and they're important also in this talk. So we name for SX and EX, uh, we create some er uh, two arrays, and the X value of S and the X value of E marks the start and the end of the X run, where X is, is an index between 1 and R. and uh, R is the number of runs in, in the BWT. We are in particular interested in two queries, namely for we want to get the predecessor in E, which can be the value itself, or, and the successor, but here we want always to have a strictly larger value. And for that, we just build standard predecessor and data structures on that. But I'm not talking much about the R index. I'm now talking about our new data structure, which is on the next slide. So what we have here is a so-called phi inverse graph, which works as follows. So this graph represents nodes, which are the values in E. And I've listed on the left side S and E and also the predecessor of the next column in S, which is why, why is it important? Because we draw an arc from one node to another. If this one node, its next column, the, the S column, its predecessor is this guy down there. So for instance, for 27, you go diagonal to the 9 and query for the predecessor in E. And this gives you 4. So you know that for 27, you go to 4. And you do that for all elements in E. Next slide. So you get this graph here. And we don't just create this graph. We also label the arcs. Next slide, please. And what we do is that each arc has a so-called cost and a limit. And the cost is defined by from you. Know, what would you do is that you take the difference between this value and its predecessor in the next column, like for uh, 27, you go down, you go to the 9, but 9 is not the direct predecessor, but 4 is the predecessor. So the cost is the difference, which is 5. And the limit, it's if you take a value in E, you want to store where is the next value in E. So um, this tells you, for instance, for 22 in the second row, that uh, the limit is one because there's 23 in E. Okay, so why is this graph interesting? So next slide, please. So for instance, we take an, an edge um, 27 to four. Why do we do that? So for instance, we start with the first suffix array value, which we have already computed. And the goal is that we want to reconstruct 
consecutively first uh, suffix array entries. And then we want to show how to skip or omit some of these computation steps. So I assume that we have already the first suffix array value entry, which is 27. And we query for its predecessor, which is luckily 27, because it's already stored in, in this, this graph. So we have cost of zero across this image. There's always a difference between the predecessor. And what we do is this arc traversal. So we take the, with, the arcs are always unique because each node has just one outgoing arc and that we take. And we look at the arc and uh, query for its uh, limit, which is tier one, and this limit is larger than our cost, which is zero. So we move along this arc to the node four and collect its cost, which is five. And we add this cost to our accumulated costs. And we already can report the next suffix array value, which is the level four, the level of the node, plus our cost five. Next slide, please. So we move on, have the next arc, which is zero six. six uh, the limit six is, all, is also larger than our accumulated cost five. So we can move on to the next. Uh, node 12 and report it because 12 plus the cost 5 is 17. And that's again the next suffix array value. Next slide, please. Okay, here for this arc, we are stuck because the limit is just 3. And this is large, uh, the 3 is, is less than what we've already accumulated as costs, so 5. So we have to stop. And here you can see why we need these limits because it tells us that uh, currently chosen predecessor, which we assumed here 12, and we had the suffix array value 17, that 12 is no longer the direct predecessor, but a predecessor of some other predecessor. So we have to query again for E, which is the current predecessor of 17, which is not 12, but 15. So we go to the next slide where we can see that um, we need um, to take 15, uh, update our cost, which is 2, the difference to 17. And we can see that we can now take this arc, which has a limit of 3, go to 20, uh, 23 uh, at the cost of 1 and report 26 as the next suffix array value, which is uh, the node value 23 plus a cost 3. Next slide, please. So, but just taking an arc, we can omit the predecessor query. And this gives us already a small speed up. But to get to jump over multiple values, we want to be even faster. And with that, we cut out long paths, like shown here in orange, and build fine verse trees on that. Next slide, please. So this is uh, one of these cut out paths. And we interpret each outgoing edge uh, as the node itself. Next slide, please. Um, so this becomes set shape. Next slide, please. Uh, we pad up this pass to be a power of two. Next slide, please. Such that we can build a perfect binary tree on top of this pass. Next slide, please. And again, next. <laughs> it's quite a bunch. Um, what we do here is that each internal node gets also a label of costs and limits, where we just sum up the costs of the children. And for the limit, we take the, either the leftmost, the limit of the leftmost child, or the rightmost minus the cost of the leftmost, which is, whichever is smaller. So the left part means that we emulate the traversals that we already did in the past for the leftmost and therefore paid already C1 costs. Next slide, please. So what we do is that we climb up until reaching the limit of a node. And then if we have reached that, we go down to the first leaf where we exceed the limit. And we can I can just show you how we did it for a small example. Next slide. Where we take for instance, we, we are at 27, and we want to show how far we can get. 
let's say we have a cost of zero and then we climb up, we reach the node seven minus four, minus four is not traversable because it's negative. That's also because, um, yeah. And therefore, well, we now descend and go down where we uh, find the node uh, zero is three because all other nodes above, we cannot go to the right because we never can exceed, uh, we always exceed the limit there. And there we are reached the node 12 and we had the cost five, which we got from um, the left uh, branch, five one. So we had added that up to 12 and get 17. So we reported this, uh, the third suffix array value when skipping the second one. But we can even skip even more suffix array values if, if the example allows that. And we did that for some experiments. Next slide, please. Uh, with chromosome 19 from the 1000 Human Genomes Project with some you know, machine. And uh, we only did it for um, in comparison with the standard RNX techniques because for the other approaches, uh, the mm, techniques are quite similar that you always start from a known position and then to find worst steps. So you subsequently decode the suffix array. Next slide. Unfortunately, you can see that the, the, the experiments are kind of preliminary and we couldn't see that speed up we wanted to experience. You can see on the right hand side that the memory is a little bit larger because we of course need to store the fine verse graph and um, these fine verse trees. Let's next slide, please. So in conclusion, we introduced the Vineverse Forest, which is an order of R space data structure on top of the R index. It provides random access to the suffix array and the query time depends on the length of a run and the values of the costs and the limits. So as open problems, uh, we have only trivial bounds for instance, for a fine verse tree traversal, because we have at most order of R leaves, the up and downward traversal of this perfect binary tree costs order of log R time. Or you can do a predecessor query in that time. But we need more theoretical analysis on the number of predecessor calls. And that's all. And I hope I don't overdue it too much. So, but thanks for listening and any questions are welcome.